By now, you should be feeling pretty comfortable with derivations and sentential logic. What we finished with were theorems, and theorems were sentences that are tautologies in our logical system. They're true no matter what. So we could actually end up deriving them from no premises, and that's what a theorem derivation is. It's a zero premise proof. Now theorems, it turns out, are actually very useful because if it's actually valid in all cases, if it's a tautology, what that means is if we have a theorem that's useful, we can use it in any of our derivations that we want because we know that they're always true. So theorems then can actually be like new rules that we can use. How many theorems are there? Well, there's actually infinitely many theorems. So the challenge is how do we pick which ones are useful? Well, it turns out that in our logical system, we've named a handful of theorems that are quite useful. And we've actually literally named them as opposed to just being called theorem 207, for example. So we're going to highlight five special theorems that will make up what will be called our derived rules. And these are like expanded rules that will essentially function as shortcuts uh, in our derivations that would make an otherwise long and complicated derivation uh, quite simple and direct to prove. Derived rules are theorems then, but I like to divide them up into two types. The first is negation of rules, and the second are situational rules. I'm really going to focus on the negation of rules, but we'll see that situational rules are helpful every once in a while, hence the name situational. So remember that when we are doing our basic proofs uh, using our 10 basic rules, contradiction generators were very important. And the reason why we needed contradiction generators was because sometimes we'd have the negation of something and we couldn't do anything to it. That negation was basically tying that sentence together and we couldn't access any of the parts, either the inside or, or whatever. So what we needed to do was we needed to show the unnegated form such that we could get a, a contradiction and do an ID. Now, it turns out that we don't always need to do this. Uh, this is actually not necessary if we had a rule that was essentially like an elimination of negation rule. And that's what our negation of rules actually. The first one then is called negation of conditional. Very easy to remember. And it's very straightforward. It says if I have the negation of a conditional, so if I have negation phi arrow psi, I can then immediately conclude phi and not psi. Now, how does this actually make sense? Well, you just need to remember, what does the negation of a conditional actually mean? A negation of conditional means that the conditional is false, because that's how the negation would be made true. But what is the only condition such that a conditional is false? It's when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, which is exactly what the conclusion of negation of conditional says. It says, if I have the negation of phi arrow psi, then I know that the antecedent and the negation of the consequent must be so. Now, like all our rules that we looked at, you can also go in the other direction. If you have phi and not psi, you can conclude negation phi arrow psi. But this direction isn't nearly as helpful as eliminating the negation. Our next negation of rule is the negation of biconditional. It too is very straightforward. It says negation of a biconditional, we can then conclude phi biconditional not psi. Now again, this makes sense because a biconditional says that both sides have to have the exact same truth value. So if you have the negation of a biconditional, it says the sides have to have opposite truth value. This is also known as exclusive or, which of course is phrased as phi uh, biconditional, not psi in this case. This says that they have opposite truth value. Now you might wonder, how come I can't infer not phi biconditional psi? Like, I just need to move the negation to one of them. Why does it have to be the psi? Why does it have to be the right part of the biconditional as opposed to the left? Actually, this is totally arbitrary and is dictated by convention alone. Our system, negation of biconditional, does move the negation to the right side of the biconditional and we cannot make exceptions. So although that is a little silly, uh, we just have to stick to the rules and we'll be fine. Our last negation of rule is De Morgan's Law. And De Morgan's Law has many, many, many different forms. Now, I'm not going to go over all the forms. In fact, there's a very easy way to remember De Morgan's. Once we become comfortable with De Morgan's, then we can look at all the different forms and sort of figure out what they are. But the forms just amount to shortcuts of dealing with negations, which I'm not even going to worry about. So 
What does De Morgan's actually say? Uh, De Morgan's is very straightforward, and these are the two forms that I'm going to focus on. They are the negation of the disjunction as well as the negation of the conjunction. And from these negation of, we can infer something else. So what is this thing? Well, De Morgan's has a general pattern. The pattern of De Morgan's is that first we distribute the negations, and then we flip the main connective. So if I have the negation of phi or psi, I distribute the negation and change the sign so that I get not phi and not psi. Similarly, negation of phi and psi becomes not phi or not psi. Now, we've actually seen De Morgan's in action before. When we were doing our truth tables for uh, neither nor and not both, we realized that there was more than one way to say it. And it turns out that those are the De Morgan's variants of those uh, phrasing. So this is the law. Now, you can go back and take a look and memorize all the other forms if you want to, but I would strongly suggest you just stick to uh, this general way of remembering it, which is distribute and flip. Now, like all the other rules that we've seen in the past, these rules are literal. You cannot shortcut and sort of just add and drop negations because it sort of makes sense. You unfortunately have to take the rule as literally as possible, and then you'll be fine. So when we go back to our five skills to master, uh, how, is, how do the derived rules help us at all? Well, the key is the derived rules help us with step four. We don't have to worry so much about contradiction generators anymore because they just don't really come into play. Uh, instead, we can just power through, or what I like to call use brute force, and open up a negation of something using our negation of rules. So we don't need to look for contradiction generators nearly as much. We can just power through the proof. This derivation has three premises and a conclusion. I want to show that conclusion, and that's always where we start. Show, not w or not z. Now this proof isn't terribly complicated, but what I will show you is that the sort of having all the derived rules makes this quite easy. If I didn't have my derived rules, I'm not quite sure where to start. In fact, I would actually have to invoke a bit of structure and realize I should show one side and so on, and it's going to be a bit complicated. But I don't have to do any of that stuff when I have all my derived rules. I can just proceed by brute force. I'm just going to invoke an assume ID automatically. And so that is assume ID. Now what I can do with this is it's a negation of a disjunction. In the past, I haven't been able to do anything, but now I can actually apply it to Morgan's. De Morgan says distribute the negation and flip the sign. Now I know there's a shortcut to De Morgan's where I can peel off on the negations, whatever. I'm not even going to worry about it. I'm just going to remember to distribute the negations and flip the sign. And that is line two De Morgan's. Now this is really nice because I can immediately simplify these lines and get at the parts. So I can simplify line three because it's a conjunction now to W. That is three, simplify, and of course I did a double negation. And I might as well just simplify uh, the Z as well. And you know what? I'm just going to actually leave it as not not z, and that is 3 simplify. OK, I just did a lot of moves, and I'm not even really sure where that's going to lead me, but I know I have w and not not z. So now I'm just hunting around for more automatic moves. Automatic moves are the form uh, where I can just eliminate something immediately. And I can see there's a couple waiting for me right here. I have w, arrow, not s and t, I have w, so I can get not s and t. That is four premise one modus ponens. Okay, fine. I also have not not z, and I have two modus tollens waiting for me right here. So that gives me a s, that is five premise two, um, actually, sorry. Uh, you know, that's right, 5 premise 2, modus tollens, double negate. And over here, uh, I can do it again. I can modus tollens this to get t, and that is um, 5 premise 3, modus tollens, double negate. Now what do I do? Well, I can see that I could build the conjunction here for the contradiction. That's actually really nice and fast and easy. But let's say I didn't see that. The nice thing about the derived rules is I can just proceed without having to worry about things like contradiction generators. So I can just say, hey, that's the negation of, a, of an and. I'm just going to use De Morgan's, and I get not s or 
not t. That's six De Morgans because I distributed it and flipped. And line 10, now, oh, I can do a modus tollendo opponents. No problem. I'll take my line 7 and double negate it and MTP to get not T. That's line 7, double negate. And then I have the negation of one side of a disjunction. And so I can use modus tollendo opponents. And of course, I'm done. T and not T are contradictions. And I can say 8, 10, ID. So under this assumption, I got a contradiction, which means that my assumption I reject and I've shown what I wanted. So this example only used Morgan's. It didn't make use of the other negation of rules, but it's nice and simple and it shows you how uh, you can just sort of attack a problem with all the derived rules. You don't need to worry about all sorts of other things. It's just sort of a nice, easy shortcut into getting right at the derivation. Negation of conditional, negation of biconditional, and De Morgan's which is the negation of disjunction and the negation of conjunction, are our derived rules for our system. There are obviously lots of other helpful theorems that have names, and we could actually expand our list of derived rules to be even more. Uh, but for our purposes, we're only going to add two others, which are situation rules that come up every once in a while. Uh, depending on which book you read or which system you do, uh, the named rules that are very helpful can be expanded and expanded and expanded. But we're not too worried, and we're going to keep it nice and simple. So the first situational rule that we're going to look at is called separation of cases. Now, separation of cases has two forms, and what's odd about this is the forms seem seems sort of different, and we're going to see our first rule that actually uses three uh, premises, to the rule as opposed to just two or one, which we've seen in the past. Now, there's nothing really odd about this. Uh, it's just you just have to remember that when you actually apply the rule in terms of your justification. Now, separation of cases makes a lot of sense, both forms. So let's look at the first form. It says phi or psi, and we also know phi arrow chi, and we also know psi arrow chi, I can conclude chi. So what does this mean? Well, it basically just says, look, if I have two options, say left or right, and those are the only two options, and both options take me to the same place, like Rome, well then I can clearly conclude that well, I will end up in that place, namely Rome, and that is separation of cases. Now the other form of separation of cases doesn't actually have the disjunction built in. It says phi arrow chi, not phi arrow chi, therefore chi. And the reason it doesn't have the disjunction built in is because it's obvious that I only have the option phi or not psi. Uh, that is sort of implicit in the argument. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, there's only two possibilities about phi. Either it's positive or it's negative. And if both of those take you to the same place, then same story, you're in the same place. And that is the separation of cases rule. Now the other situational rule is conditional as disjunction. Now, CDJ is actually a very popular rule, and uh, a lot of people like to use it, but I sort of find that it's worth just using very sparingly, because CDJ can actually sort of spin you in all sorts of odd directions. What CDJ lets you do is it lets you move from a conditional to a disjunction and back and forth. Now, we actually already know that this is possible, because when we learned how to symbolize unless, one natural interpretation of unless was if not one, then the other which is a conditional statement. And another perfectly natural uh, interpretation of unless is or. So it turns out that that is the CDJ rule. It is the observation that if not one, then the other is equivalent to uh, or. And depending on where the negation sign is, that's how you would actually implement the rule. So why wouldn't we want to use this rule in general? Because we have rules that already deal with conditionals, and we have rules that deal with dis disjunctions. We don't really typically need to move back and forth between them uh, just for the sake of it. Uh, however, there is one situation where CDJ is sometimes useful, and uh, that's when we actually need to show a conditional statement. So if I want to show a conditional like phi arrow psi, remember this is the typical pattern. We do a conditional derivation. We show phi, sorry, we assume phi, then we need to show psi, and so on. Box and close, we do a CD, no problem. But it turns out with CDJ, we can actually show something else. So instead of showing 
uh, directly the conditional using a conditional derivation, I can actually choose to show a disjunction form of the conditional. So if instead of showing phi arrow psi, I can show not phi or psi. Why would I do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe it just turns out that showing the disjunction is somehow easier. So I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, let's say I assume ID, I do it to Morgan's, I could do some simplifications, and eventually let's assume that I succeed in the derivation. And I've successfully shown not phi or psi. Well, now what I do is I use the CDJ rule. I use conditional as disjunction, and I convert my not phi or psi directly into the the conditional statement phi arrow psi, and then that's it. That's a direct derivation of exactly what it wanted, and I can box and close. So is this more useful than just doing a conditional derivation? I'm not sure. Some people really like it. Typically, you won't see me doing these moves. Let's do a more difficult example of a full rule derivation. This derivation has three premises and a conclusion. We can just start off by writing the show of the conclusion, no problem show not p or bracket q by conditional r. Now, in this case, I'm going to uh, use all my rules, so I can just open up with an assume ID before I even sort of start anything. And the reason why this is nice is because it just lets me uh, do a De Morgan's and I get some available lines immediately. So this is assume ID. Now notice I, I haven't really even looked around at my derivation. I'm just doing the automatic moves. And the automatic moves here are actually quite nice. I can just immediately get a conjunction here by distributing the negation and flipping. And I get Q by conditional R. And that's two De Morgans. And I can actually immediately simplify. So I'll take three, simplify, and I'll double negate it. Why not? And I'll also uh, simplify this side as well. And that's 3 simplify. Now I realize this is the negation of a biconditional, so I can just apply my negation of biconditional rule again without really thinking too hard about this. Uh, these are just a lot of automatic moves. So in the end, I broke down my show line and I got line 4 and line 6 as my useful moves. So here I have premise 1, that's a big conditional, premise 2 is disjunction, and premise 3 is a conditional. Now notice, I can't really do anything to any of these premises. A conditional, I need to modus ponens or modus tollens. A disjunction here, I need to have the negation of one side, and for a conditional, again I'm looking at MP or MT. And all I have here is P and this biconditional Q by conditional negation R, which I know I can sort of split up. So it's not really that obvious what uh, I should be doing here, so I need to try and build something that would be useful. So I can try and build the antecedent here, the negation of the consequent. I can try and build this antecedent, this negation of the consequent, or I can try and build the negation of one side. In fact, I could actually do any of those six things I just listed, and uh, all of them would actually work and sort of lead me somewhere. So I'm probably going to have to do some combination of things, but it is worth noting that the simplest thing I have here is P. So P is just a nice atomic on its own, and P appears somewhere else, which is right here. So I might actually want to think that what I want is the negation of this side so that I can use modus tollendo ponens. And so that would be really nice if I had P or W. Of course, P or W is really easy because I just need one of them, P, which I actually have. So on line seven, I can just build P or W really easily by saying for uh, add anything I want, and that's what I have. And then I will double negate this modus tollendo ponens, and I get Q, seven, double negate, premise 2, MTP. Uh, so this was a really nice move, and it's easy to sort of see after I did it that, you know, it made sense. The hard part is actually realizing this is what I should do. And remember, I'm looking for something that would be helpful, which is the negation of a disjunction. So what do I do now? Well, now I have this nice line Q. I've dealt with this premise. And Q, I can see uh, if I split this biconditional into Q arrow not R, I will just be able to modus ponens and get not R. So again, that's line 6. I split the biconditional into Q arrow not R, and then I'll take line 8 and modus ponens. 
Again, a nice little line, and I have not R. Okay, so I've sort of taken care of this, or I've used it. Uh, P is always handy to look at, but now I have Q, not R. What should I do? Well, I basically have two options here. I could build something over here, or I could build something over here. And it looks like uh, this not R is sort of going to be helpful over here, so I'm going to try and work with this premise. And so premise one, the antecedent here, is X conditional not R. And so I really want to have this so I can modus ponens, because if I modus ponens, I'm going to be able to do something with this consequent. So when I want something, and I'm not sure how to get it directly, and it doesn't look like I can at all, this is where you insert a new show line. And I'm going to show exactly what I want which is x conditional not r. Again, finding this is easy. The hard part is realizing that this is what I want. It's the only elimination rule that I have for conditional that I'm likely to sort of be able to succeed in achieving. Uh, and so let's start. First I get x and that is assume conditional because this is conditional derivation. And then on line 12 uh, I actually realize that I want to show not r but I already have not r. It's just that easy. I write not r, that's 9 repeat, and then I just say, hey, that's it. That's my conditional derivation. Under the assumption of x, I was able to show not r. Now, I know this seems sort of like cheating. I had not r already, but that's sort of the point of this derivation. It's to realize that once I know I needed to show this, actually showing it is quite easy. Now I have x arrow not r. I can just run modus ponens, and I get not bracket z arrow w. And this is line 10, premise 1, modus ponens. Now finally, I can negation of conditional this. The negation of conditional says I affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent. And that's 13 and C. Now of course I can simplify this now whenever I want, and that's great. And I've used premise 1. Now to finish here, I know that I'm looking for some sort of contradiction, but there's a lot going on. I can sort of just take my time and uh, I'll just sort of attack uh, this last premise here. So uh, on line 15, well, what I'll realize is this is not W over here. That's the antecedent. So it'd be nice if I had the antecedent. Well, I actually do. So no problem. I will simplify line 14 modus ponens to get not bracket z and q and that's line 14 simplify right and premise 3 modus ponens now this is the negation of a conjunction so i can de morgan's which means i distribute and i flip the sign and that's 15 de morgan's so another one of my uh, derived rules now i'm just going to stare at this line it would be really nice if I had the negation of one side, and it turns out I do twice. So I'll take this z, and sure, I'll just take the time to double negate it. This is line 14, simplify, double negate, and now we can see I have the negation of one side, so I can use modus to lend opponents, and I can affirm the other side, not q. And so this is from 16, 17, mtp. On line 19 now, I can just realize that I have a contradiction already. Here's my Q, here's my not Q, and that is my proof. And now I can cite line 8 and 18, indirect derivation, because I have a contradiction. Okay, this was a nice derivation. Uh, it's actually an old question from one of my tests in previous years. And it really demonstrates all the derived rules, but as well, it demonstrates a bit of sort of knowledge. I had to realize that this P was sort of the smartest thing to start my proof on, and I built P or W, which gave me the negation of one side of a disjunction for modus to lend opponents. Remember, it's important to ask what would be helpful to have. Now, another sort of interesting thing was even when I got that done, I was still stuck. And in order to get unstuck, I had to deal either with premise one or premise three. I chose premise one, and I tried to build the antecedent. If I couldn't do it directly, always show something that would be very convenient to have. This is the key logical move of the proof. If you write down the show line, the rest of the proof sort of just falls apart using rules like negation of conditional. So that's it for the derived rules. I cover five, but really there's only three that I think are incredibly important, and those are the negation of. You really want to have your derived rules committed to memory, 
and uh, they're very helpful when they're available to you because you can just sort of shortcut proofs and use brute force instead of having to generate contradictions, uh, which can be a bit difficult. Now, once we start opening up and having all these rules, one sort of difficulty is that we might be worried about what to do. In fact, there's so many sort of different options. I'm not so sure what to do. Should I use this rule? Should I use that? And this can be a bit overwhelming. But just remember, now we've added a third type of rule. So really, we only have three broad types. They are eliminations, introductions, and negation of rules. And so what you actually should do in any given case is almost always determined by the main connective and applying the right rule in the situation. If the main connective is a conjunction, well, then you only have one option. That's to eliminate the conjunction. If your main connective is a negation, you only have one option, which is to use the proper negation of rule. So focus on mastering the five skills and don't feel overwhelmed if there's a lot of rules. They all sort of fall into place as you sort of become appreciative of how the structure of a derivation essentially tells you what you should be doing. Do lots of practice. Good luck.